Today is December 20th, 2019. We are doing an oral history with Jim Myers and Sally Walcott Myers, correct? Correct. Um, I'd like to start out about the Walcott family okay. and tell us a little bit about the importance of them to our history, which is a lot. Well, my grandfather was a, a prosecutor for the city of Kent. Uh, he was a lawyer, obviously. Um, and, they, and what was his name? Duncan Wilkins. The house they lived in on Main Street, I think they bought that. No, it, it was their parents' house. It was Simon. Yeah. Okay. Simon right. Perkins Wilkins' okay. house. He yeah. built it. <coughs> okay. He built it. And that's the Wilcock Garden. That's the right. that's Lilac where, Garden. Where uh -huh. Daisy, who was Sally's grandmother, Yes, basically. And do we have an Daisy. idea of when that was built, the Lilac Gardens? I had that in the paper. It would, have been, I... it would have been before the Civil War, I think, okay. about that time, because that's when uh, they got married. Uh, she was the daughter of Anson Brewster of Hudson, one of the settlers, early settlers, her husband, a businessman, and he... Simon, hmm. help me, Sally. It was all in that paper I left. No, know. I've got a paper over there too. But oh, that's all right. Okay. But that was her great grandparents, and they're oh, the ones that built the house. Yeah. And uh, Duncan was one of their sons. Uh, he had a son and two daughters, and uh, Duncan then became a prosecutor, like his uh, father, also a lawyer, and uh, he argued the case for bringing Kent State to uh, Kent, Ohio, before the state legislature. So oh. that was his importance as far as the community was concerned, besides being solicitor for the city of Kent, one of the leaders of the Chamber of Commerce when it was the home of Hump and Hustle. <laughs> <laughs> On the school board, several terms. But Sally's uh, grandmother, Daisy, Daisy Lodge, who, who planted all those uh, lilacs came from Uncle Plum or somebody in mm -hmm. Chicago who had the largest private collection of lilacs in the country. And I think it still exists in Chicago, uh, the Plum Gardens. And that was a cousin of hers or an uncle or something. And he sent her the, all the clippings and the plantings and she went after it. Um, some of the literature I was reading told about, and this is what you were taking over to Zavodny. Uh, it told about how privileged a gardener um, Simon Perkins was. Simon Perkins woke it. And his father had come from Northampton Township. The whole family got here. This is I, She should be telling this, but yeah, I know it better than she does. Yes, he does. <laughs> the family got here because one of the original surveyors that came from the Connecticut Western Reserve settled through Brimfield, first settled in Youngstown, married a woman from Canfield. And Youngstown is named for John Young, who was the surveyor, and her great-great-grandfather worked on the surveying team. So when he got out here, uh, Northampton, he thought he just loved it and thought it was as pretty as Connecticut ever could be. And so uh, he settled there. And uh, then Simon and, and uh, Mary Helen Brewster got together and formed a relationship. And she was from Hudson. Right. Okay. Right. So Sally, when you were a little girl, what do you remember about going to walk up to the Lilac oh, Gardens? Oh, well, uh, we knew where there was a bush called our Sally's Bush, and there was one for my sister, Carol's Bush. We knew where that was, so we would go there and look at it, but uh, that was about it. Um, and I remember them having an outhouse. <laughs> Way in the back. Way in the back. Huh? And I said, oh my gosh, how <laughs> awful it would be to have to get out of bed at night and go to that outhouse that's way in the back of this property. And the answer was? And they have thunder mugs under thunder their Thunder mugs beds. under the bed. Oh yeah. <laughs> because that house was built without indoor plumbing. Uh, later added, as was the oh, yeah, kitchen they... and all. <laughs> but um, as a child, you went there and played. Oh yeah. Yeah, because you only lived a couple blocks away, and so did I. I didn't actually play at her house, but I remember going to the Walcott Lilac Gardens 
because I lived on Park Avenue and she lived on Earl Avenue and yeah yeah close. Were you, do you remember when it was open to the public? Or oh yeah yeah five thousand people on a weekend. The town the town literally just jammed with people to see these lilacs. And twenty five came, cents to get in and see came the from gardens. All over. Wasn't it yeah. twenty five cents? Twenty five cents. That's what <laughs> that's what sur sustained her raising three no four boys, one being her father, after her husband died at age fifty seven. Wow. He died very unexpectedly, and uh, she was left with the house and, and, and uh, no income. <laughs> so the yeah. lilac gardens became her source of money. <laughs> so she would do this. Crazy. How many weekends would she well, open it? Well, two or three weekends were... during uh, May. May. Usually was when it happened, uh, and it was it was a big deal, a real big deal. And the, the lilacs were just gorgeous, far more extensive uh, the gardens were than anything we look at now. And people would just park everywhere. everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Coming yeah. for the day mm -hmm. to come to, to the Lilac Garden. To yeah. pay their 25 cents to go in. Well, Sally, <laughs> Sally's other grandfather was pretty prominent in Kent, too. He was John Salter, and he was the plant manager for Lamps and Sessions Company. Uh -huh. Her uncle, Roy Salter, then ultimately followed him. Um, they came from Canada, though. Yeah. Grandpa came from yeah. Canada. But he was working in... Boston, I think, when Major Smith solicited him to come be his plant manager. Uh, so trivia, isn't trivia, it? Trivia. <laughs> well, it's interesting the Canadian connection oh, yeah. that yeah. they were moving down. Uh -huh. uh, the squirrels came far later. <laughs> had nothing to do with the sulfurs. <laughs> um, uh. Let's let's talk a little bit about you individually. First of all, Sally. <coughs> What do you remember most about growing up in Kent? I know you weren't here all the time. No, is that I would correct? just come with my parents to visit <coughs> our grandparents. And um, well, that was after you left here. Oh yeah. And when did you leave Kent? Oh, junior high. Were you in elementary school? Uh, I was here Forget. in elementary school and junior high. Yes. And which schools did you attend? Central, and then Davy. Well, but it wasn't Davy. No, it, wasn't it, was, it. it was it was Theodore Roosevelt High School. Oh. But it was grades seven through twelve. So you got up sixth grade. You got out of elementary school. Yeah. And what would you be? Uh, twelve years old, and you're with eighteen year olds in the same building. And did you do the same thing? I did the same. Yeah. You were at Central. Central. And then... Yeah, I walked to Central, and she lived about three <laughs> doors away, and I lived about three doors away on the opposite sides, but. We knew each other from Sandbach days. Yes. Hardly. But, <laughs> but I'm sure we had played together once or twice. Yeah. We would go over to Central School to play. Yeah. Because that was between my house and your house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the playground was there. So that's Now, is this go. the Central School that. Same was, location. But it was the Union School. It was school. the Union School. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Tell, us, tell us a little bit about the Union School going to school there because it was. Three stories. Built after the Civil War. Right. Three stories tall, um, old wooden rickety, and the third floor, as I remember, was condemned because the pigeons had taken it over. <laughs> and we used two floors uh, through elementary school. Uh, and I think there was a kindergarten in the basement, too. Uh, it was there until I was either in college in the 50s or I was in the service in the 50s, and that's when it was torn down. And the new current Central School was built. So, yeah, it was it was a fun time. Had a nice playground and mm -hmm. right in the middle of a residential section. So, mm -hmm. loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Great, and it was great pretty, teachers. It was um, built after the Civil War with the idea right. that they would never need another school. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> the Union so School. Big. Right. And uh, there were kids. From the whole of Kent that went there? No. I think my mother went there. Yeah, she did, but they lived in that neighborhood. No, there were three well, elementary schools. Yeah. There was De Peister School at the time, and there was uh, South School. Mm -hmm. um, now they, uh, which became Holden Elementary. Uh, those were the three schools. And, and St. Patrick's. Yeah, there was a feeder system, too. Uh, the uh -huh. Catholic Church, I think, had grades up till eighth grade, maybe, or sixth grade, one of the two. Interesting how uh, we got together. Oh, well, tell. <laughs> oh, 
Well, let's see. Where do I start this story? <laughs> well, anyway, let's go back because you grew up in Kent and then you left. Oh, yeah. And then tell all the places that you lived. Well, I moved from Kent and to why? Euclid because my dad was working for Lincoln Electric. And uh, so we moved into an apartment in Euclid, and that's where I walked to school. Long, long walk down this. Euclid Avenue. Yeah. <laughs> All these terrible cars going by all the time. But anyhow, I made it every day. Then he got transferred. Yes. To, to Toledo. No. No, I missed one. No, two. He <laughs> was transferred to Boston. Oh. oh. The shipbuilding industry That's right. at the mid and end of the Second World War was really booming. And she moved to Hingham, Massachusetts, which was just uh -huh. below where the shipbuilding was uh -huh. done. You loved it there, didn't you? That was great oh, there. Yeah. yeah. Great. She was a teenager there. But, yeah, and I would ride the bus every day to school, which was fun <laughs> back then. Then he got transferred again after a couple of years to New Jersey. He was in the New York market at that point. And that's when you graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. Where? Grover Cleveland High School. In Caldwell, Caldwell New, New Jersey. Jersey. Right. <laughs> and at that point, you went to college at the University of New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I also had gone to Catherine Gibbs Secretarial School. Which you graduated from. Yeah. So you can that do was, stenography. Yes. Oh, yes. And that was in Montclair, New Jersey, which was just a town away from where my folks lived, which was easy. And I worked at the Sears and Roebuck store in that town. It was in my hardware. other job. In hardware, wasn't it? I was selling paint. <laughs> yeah. I think I probably should say this. Would you give your birth dates? Sure. Oh, ours? Sure. Yes. Sure. Sally? January 18th, 1933. April 10th, 1931. Okay. Yeah. So I'm 88 and she's that? 86 and she's almost going to be 87 <laughs> in January. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you come back to Kent? Because of Jim, obviously, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> was a good reason. I'll elaborate. Okay. Um, when I graduated from high school I had Three close friends, and two of them, and myself, got my dad's car, I talked him into it, and uh, we drove to see New York City and Washington, D.C., because we'd never been there. And uh, we knew we were going to be close to New York City, and Sally was living then in Caldwell. Caldwell. So New Jersey. My one friend, Bob Lovell, had lived across the street from Sally. So he gets in touch with her and said, we're going to come, fix us up with dates. Oh. So, she fixed me up with her best friend, mm -hmm. and she fixed up with Bob Lovell, and Bill Allen was the other one of Allen's drain service. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I, I kind of took a too. liking to the gal that she fixed me up with, so we remained <laughs> friends over about, friend. <laughs> about a two-year period. In the meantime, <laughs> I'm playing football at Kent State, and Kent State is playing the University of New Hampshire while Sally's there. Uh, at the time, Paul Amadio, who later became the athletic director at Kent, he and I were close friends because we'd grown up playing at Central School together. And he, he was a pretty good running back. So I got to travel with the team to the University of New Hampshire, and then we had a double date because her friend was then going to school somewhere in Massachusetts. Endicott. Endicott Junior College, mm -hmm. right. And she came up, and the four of us went out and had a good time. Then, as the summers would progress and Sally would come back to visit her grandparents every summer, that's what you were leading up to. I had to report to him about her. Yeah, about friend. her. We'd get together and eventually I got the, the pink slip and <laughs> your John letter. You get the your Jim letter. But in the meantime, I decided Sally was a lot more fun to be with than Chris Jensen. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, we kind of started dating and having a good time. Our first date, I vividly remember it, because um, we went dancing under the stars at Myers Lake Ballroom, which yes. was an outdoor <coughs> orchestra ballroom down at Canton. Uh, it's still there, Myers Lake is, but not the uh, outdoor ballroom. Anyway, we started dating. Um, I go off to Ohio Northern, get a pharmacy degree, and Sally's father gets transferred again to Toledo, Ohio. Mm -mm. An hour's drive up the highway. From you. From me. 
at, at, uh, at Ada. <laughs> so uh, that kind of cemented our relationship. And I was, by then in my senior year, I had a four-year program that I turned into a five-year program because I had to be there three years and I'd already gone to Kent for two years. And I had off Mondays and Fridays. Oh, that's a nice schedule. Wow. So every weekend I drive up, play golf in the morning, stop and pick up Sally at work Friday night downtown Owens, Illinois. You mm -hmm. were a secretary there. Mm -hmm. And um, spend the weekend and then take her to work on Monday and drive back to school. So that, well, I, I, that continued and we got engaged. Oh, yes. You got to tell them what you said to me when I asked if you'd marry me. Oh, yeah. It's Christmas time. Yeah. I said, what do you think? That was the answer. What do you think? What do you think? And he thought, I said, yes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and how many years later is this now? 64. It'll be 65 in April. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sounds good. Good marriage. Good marriage. Oh. So I have good to marriage. ask, because you mentioned football. Mm -hmm. And since football has changed so much, no, yeah. what years were you playing and what was it like? Uh, I started playing when I was a freshman in high school. Uh, I finished playing when I was a senior at Ohio Northern, so that was nine years. He was the quarterback. Yeah, I quarterback. Uh, played nine years, and she watches the game today on television. She said, this game is brutal. I said, yes, it is, but it wasn't like that then. Yeah. I mean, we didn't wear face guards. We wore leather helmets. There was nobody that weighed 300 pounds. The biggest fella that I think I ever played with was in high school and he weighed 225 pounds. He was a monster compared to us. We had kids playing 150, 160 pounds, 170 pounds. Even in college, it was rare to find 200 pound guys, at least wow. at Ohio Northern. Now, yeah. when I was at Kent State, they were bigger. Yeah, because yeah. they drew a bigger, a bigger crowd. But uh, so it wasn't the game's basically the same, but it is it wasn't as violent then as it is now. And you you never suffered no. obviously. No, I had a concussion once, but that didn't. It was in high school, not not in college, and it was a very quick lived. So you thing. come back to Kent. You're married now, I assume. Got in the service first. Oh, all right. And what did you do in the service? Well, um, I went through basic. Oh, our wedding. I came home from basic training in El Paso, Texas, where I, I was in a um, prisoner of war camp condemned, uh, of the German prisoner of war camp that had been condemned, and the week I went into the service, everyone enlisted to get the GI Bill because it was ending at the end of January of that year. So all of the basic training places were so overwhelmed, there was no place to put us. We sat around for weeks and did nothing because we didn't have, we didn't have uniforms, <laughs> we said they didn't have enough cadre to take care of us and treat us and no teach us, no barracks. Um, <laughs> what so, year was this, if it was at the end of the war then? Uh, oh yeah, it was uh, at the end of the Korean War. 55. Oh, 1950. Yeah. It, was, it was 1955 when I went in, in uh, the third week of January. And the last day of that month is when the GI Bill ran out for the Korean conflict. So. Uh, from there, when we came home on basic training leave, we got married. We had set up a schedule, and fortunately, Daisy died the week before we got home, that and we were planning grandmother. to get married that weekend. And her garden. We were going to be married in her garden. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, so Charlie Young, whom he was working for part-time, right, had just built a new home. And on asked Lakes. us if we would like to have our reception at his house. Because... <laughs> We were going to use Twin Lakes Country Club, and it was under renovation. So, Charlie yeah. offers it a brand new house, and it was, it was just wonderful. Yeah, it was good. So here is Charlie Young, who plays a very important part in your life. I grew up across the street from him. Did you? Yeah. yeah. So you've known him all your life? Since I was five years old. <laughs> and how did you go and, about and becoming Tullis Thompson? And Tullis and Kathleen and, and Tom. Tom was our best man in our wedding. Um, one of the sidelights was that then I got the measles on my honeymoon. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually we got to San Antonio, Texas. How did you get that? Well, uh, in that we lived in these German four-man huts, one of the fellows that I was with got the measles. He had to get his wedding rearranged because he ended up in the hospital. Yeah. Just well, to be quarantined. And Jim had to be... Uh seen by a oh. doctor 
when we went home to my family's house, well, he still got the measles. We, the... we were in Lexington, Kentucky. Yeah. When I took a shower and I looked down and I'm covered in a rash and I said, oh my God, I've got the measles. <laughs> Obviously the German measles. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we, I, I was afraid because my friend had been hospitalized that I would be really sick. Well, he was only hospitalized just to isolate him. But, yeah. I wasn't really sick, but I was afraid we were driving back to Texas, to San Antonio, and I thought, I may not be able to drive. So what are we going to do? Well, I went to a, a local doctor, and it turned out he was a retired major. It's still in the reserve. He gave Sally a gamma globulin shot, just in case she might get pregnant. <laughs> and you know, the measles can really be devastating. Mm -hmm. My mother went through that and lost her hearing. So I was aware of the dangers of the measles. Um, he said, what I would do if I were you is not drive on to Texas. He said, I would get back to Rossford Ordnance Depot in uh, Perrysburg, Ohio, which is right across the river from Maumee, where her parents lived. And he said, turn yourself in there. they will put you in sick and quarters. Well, they didn't have a hospital. So sick and quarters was at my in-laws. <laughs> I'm running, the rash by now is starting to leave me. And I'm under... It was an April that was extremely warm, maybe 60, 70 degrees warm, and I'm covered up under blankets and I'm drinking tea to keep the rash alive. And the officer comes in to examine me at her house, and he stayed across the room, he way over. He never hall. came near me. He's in the he didn't want the measles on the couch, and he is in the hall by the stairway. <laughs> he gave me at. ten days sick and quarters, <laughs> which is not off your leave time. Didn't they, have a, they, didn't they have a vaccine at that time? No. If they did, we didn't have it. No, they must not have. They must not have. In any event, we had 10 days of lovely... Uh, so we went to Chicago. We went to Chicago on our honeymoon. Hey. <laughs> we weren't planning to, but you know, hell, we got 10 days. Let's it go. It worked. Yeah, it worked. And it worked. And, yeah. then, and then when did you return to Kent and start your life in the pharmacy? One more stop, and that was uh, Fort Hood, Texas, after San Antonio. Uh, we lived in Fort Hood, Texas for about a year and a half together, uh, off base. And, and I, I was, worked on the base. Yep, she was in transportation. No, working well, I was in transport. The federal I was, government. I was and filling I was out paperwork. Working for the federal government. <laughs> and I was a clerk in a uh, medical battalion because in my medical battalion there must have been a dozen pharmacists. Wow. And the, the um, uh, hospital could only handle a few of them. And I could type pretty well, and I had a good job being company clerk. Yeah. My commanding officer was a pharmacist who had graduated the same time I had, but he had gone through ROTC. So he was a lieutenant, and I was a private and a corporal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Came back to Kent then, had a job waiting for me. At, and that was at, at Thompson's, Thompson's Drugstore, Drug where I started. And tell me a little bit about Thompson's Drugstore, which is very historic. Well, it, 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 I don't think we have time for all of that, but <laughs> um, having known Charlie Young and uh, having gone to work for him just to see if I liked pharmacy, uh, the other owner at the time was Merrill Thompson, oh. unrelated to Hale Thompson, who was really the namesake of the store, and uh, Robert Thompson was his father who really started the whole thing. But uh, I came back and had a job waiting for me when I got out of the service, and 50 years later, I'm still there. <laughs> now, the drugstore then was a little different than we think of a drugstore today. Yeah, I think so. It, it, uh, we had a soda fountain at the time. Um, we had a lot of sundry items that we sold and cosmetics, and we did a... a but Probably. wasn't it down on Main Street, close to the railroad track? Well, Is that where you're, it was? you're thinking of when Robert Thompson and Hale started. Uh -huh. They had a couple different locations. Okay. Uh, they started out where Donaghy's Drug is. They uh, moved down the street at one point, but I think before the down the street was down to what is now Ray's Place. That's what I thought. Right next to the hotel. Right. We've got pictures of Hale standing there. And then he moved up to Main Street in the old uh, Cone building, mm -hmm. which was a dry goods store. Uh, when we started, we had um, one half of the store that you might think of when we closed. Uh, we were modeled three times, I think, maybe four times while we were there. Uh, not always to the best. But you did have a soda fountain. <laughs> oh, yeah. That and was we, the plus. We eventually <laughs> closed it. You know, I remember going there as a kid. And that was, that I'm going to get them some wine. 
Oh, no, that's You're Thursday. Saying. No, not yet. Not yet. Oh, you, we'll wait. Okay. <laughs> You're now, still... Miss Sally, uh, yes, tell dear. me a little bit about Coterie oh. and some of the clubs that you as were oh. active in when you were uh, in your oh. years as uh, raising a family and stuff. You went, you had well, lots of see. women's groups that they had yeah. that were very supportive of women. Yeah. I was trying to, is it newcomers? Newcomers. Was one. Um, Junior mothers? No, I was never in there. Oh, weren't you? No. Hmm. But I know Coterie. Which Coterie were you in? Coterie 3. Coterie 3. Mm -hmm. And what was Coterie about? Just women whose husbands were working downtown at night. And so they decided they should get together while their husbands are downtown working. And they would like to fix a meal and entertain their lady friends. And you were at the Patton House. Okay, that's where they ended up eventually. But they used to be in homes. And how many houses could seat, you know, 20 women sitting down at a dining room table? And you used to have programs where people would come and oh, yeah. present mm -hmm. ideas and yeah. talk about things. You know, so it was more than just... Well, you were one of our programs. Yes, I was a program. Yes, but it was. was it was kind of a um, an educational as well as social. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to learn something. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give me a test. <laughs> no, they didn't do that. And you, James, you were very, very active and still are in well, Rotary. There's a lot, of, a lot of organizations I belong to. Yeah. Too but many to name. What Rotary is particularly important because it's still thriving as mm -hmm. opposed to it some is. of the other ones where the, right. it's yeah. hard to get people. And why do you think that it's still so important in Kent? Um, there's a diversity in the membership based upon a classification system. That's the way it used to be. Now it isn't as strict. You, there would only be, say, one pharmacist, one doctor, mm. one lawyer. but. That's gone by the wayside. But our programming has been so good. Every year uh, there's a program chairman, and uh, the programs are interesting. And it's a, uh, it, it has high moral character as far as dealing in business. Mm -hmm. There's a four-way test of everything we do. And uh, that's, that's the important thing of judging integrity in business and in, in all our dealings. Mm -hmm. so. And you've, of course, it used to be all men. And now it it's was all men until we have opened it up to women, and uh, I'm glad we did because we've had some wonderful women presidents, wonderful women members. So it's so it's yeah. thriving as opposed to something that <coughs> has, is right. no longer relevant. Anymore. We're celebrating our hundredth anniversary next year. Really? So we're trying to make a big do out of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. we will think about that. Yes. <clears throat> um. One of the things that I was interested in is, because I know you were active in many things, Jim, but I know you particularly were very excited about working with the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And tell me a little bit about what that meant and what happened while you were there. While my uh, children were going through school, I had an interest to be part of the school board. So for an 18-year period, I was on the board. That just mirrored about the time my kids were in school. Mm -hmm. um, we had wonderful superintendents, and they set wonderful agendas, um, which we as a board then would either support or try to tweak, and uh, we had many good superintendents, and I think that's why the school system has stayed on top. The other is uh, our wonderful uh, treasurer we have, Debbie Cruz. I mean, doesn't get any better, and she's remained in that job rather than taking bigger, higher-paying salary places elsewhere. But. She's uh, she's top of the heap when it comes to school treasures. So that's and, helped. And the diversity of the school children in Kent has always been really right. rich. Right. I think mm -hmm. you've had, uh, when your kids were in school, Sally, how did you feel oh. in terms of the... Well, I thought all their friends were great. <laughs> <laughs> and they my kids were always involved in sports. So that's... Um, they were playing basketball or baseball, softball, not football. <laughs> no, they were, they were good. I felt when I was going through the school system, there was good diversity. Yeah. Right. It seemed now, a good it, it's a matter of perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but 
that's how I viewed it, and uh, it, it hasn't changed. It's only gotten better, I think. Right, right. How about, um, just because I'm interested that people know this, but you were one of the founding members of the Kent Historical Society. Mm -hmm. Right. And give us a little background. I came on in 1974, but what discussions happened that suddenly they decided to start a historical society? We were kind of kicking the idea around to begin with, and then when the, uh, the Erie Railroad Depot suddenly was going to be knocked down, we got up in arms over that and said, there's got to be a way to save this building. And uh, after a lot of negotiation with the railroad, uh, we came up with a price and were able to raise enough money to buy it. Um, it's Reno. Well, it is yeah, now. It is, it now. is now. It wasn't that. It was right. a yeah. Puffer Belly restaurant before right. that, but of course, uh, even prior to that, without a name, there were a lot of well-meaning citizens that went out of their way to raise money to save that building. Uh, not only just financial donors, but uh, I think of Jim Thornton who put on plays in there. Oh right. my God. Amidst all the rubble, he's putting on quality plays uh, in the to basement ra to uh. raise money. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was ground floor. Oh, yeah. 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 Fortunately, I think that was the catalyst that brought the the group together to form, and uh, we had a lot of uh, good spirited uh, public people that that formed that. When you think of Loris Troyer, who was the historian that we uh, all miss, and, and um, Reed Strimple, um, John Carson. John was heavily involved in uh, research and, and uh, yeah. a collector of, of everything you can imagine. So, and, and the became, city of Kent. The city, the of, city Kent of Kent gave, and the attorneys you know, and, and the city We had a good, uh, that was the first city manager that helped us right. get that downtown. Right. As you look over the town and think about it over these many years, what are some of the things that you see that have changed uh, and make it a different place than people look back and say, well, I remember when it was like this. Uh, it's, you know, what is it like for you to be living in Kent today? How do you look at it? I just feel like I've always been here. Not that I have, but I'm very comfortable here. Um, we love a college town. Yeah. 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 And I worked on the campus. You did? And how many years oh, did yeah. you work in the art department? Uh, I thought I had 17 years wow. on the campus. In the art department and um, school, of, school nursing. of nursing. I started out with the nursing mm -hmm. school because they had just opened. The school of nursing. Uh-huh. Yeah. And they didn't have anybody to sit at the reception desk. <laughs> it was me. <laughs> Well, you, you bring up one of the important things, Jim, that this is a college town, and I think since 1910, yeah. that's what it is. It's a, it was a railroad town, and then it's a college mm -hmm. town. Um, I know both of you were, were during those days in May uh, in 1970. Mm -hmm. It was a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. And particularly, and I want to ask from an emotional standpoint, because I think that's really important, yeah. on that day when you're... Thompson Drugstore window was broken. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how you felt. Well, I got, I got a call at 2 in the morning, I think it was, somewhere around there, and said uh, there's been some problems downtown and your window's broken, you better get down to, down to the drugstore. So I went down and it had been broken before. So I had a paneling already made <laughs> the size of these big glass windows. They're, they were 4 by 8. That's a piece of glass. And uh, I had a 4 by 8 panel that I just stuck in place. And I didn't think too much about it. I found the hammer inside that somebody had thrown through it. But when I came out of the drugstore, there were still crowds at the top of the hill. <laughs> they were still... At 2 in the morning. At two, well, at 2 or 3 or whatever it was. Yeah, that, that was... Uh, but uh, the emotions that night weren't anything. Yeah. But as the days <laughs> progressed, it became very difficult. I happened to be president of the school board. And uh, we met at Cafe 303 on the fateful day when all the ambulances went roaring by. And we looked at each other and said, this doesn't look good. And obviously it wasn't. The following day, we had an issue on the ballot, one of the biggest issues we'd had in a long time. And we were fearful that the polls wouldn't be open, 
we were fearful even if they were, we were going to lose. We'd never lost an issue. Uh, it passed by as big a margin as we've ever had. <clears throat> and I just, to this day, I feel a pride in this community, and I just felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to have the public say yes to the school system, in spite of what had just happened, uh, to me that was that was the biggest stamp of approval that you could ever expect. And Sally, how old were your children at that time? <clears throat> were they in the schools during oh, May 4th? Oh, they were uh, walking home from Roosevelt, no, I think. No, Walls. Walls School. Oh, was it there? Yeah. And that's okay. where the guard was. That's oh, where yes, the guard yes, was. Yes. The guard was which, yes. staying. Which the board had given uh -huh. approval to, <laughs> to allow them to stay there, oh, to be yeah. bivouacked there. And how did you feel during that period of time? Was it frightening to you that day? I mean, as did you were you able to get them home? How did oh, you yeah. feel? Oh yeah, I met them coming down Willow Street. Willow Street, yeah. Uh, when I knew that the schools had been releasing kids, and uh, so I just met them, and they were fine. I have to tell you that my emotions boiled over one night. Um, a curfew had been raised uh, to prevent congregation of kids and trouble erupting. And uh, I had a police radio on. And I heard the police radio in essence say that the Dix family's household was under consideration for some damage. That and the Dix family was right behind they lived us. Right behind and us. they owned the newspaper. The newspaper. Yeah, right. And he was the chair of the the Kent university State. at the time. Board uh, of Trustees. Board yeah. of Trustees, yeah. So, here comes a young man walking down the street with a bag over his shoulder, whistling so conspicuously, I thought, what's this about? And I can hear clink, clink in the bag over his shoulder, and I'm thinking, oh my God. He turns the corner, because we lived right on the corner, he turns the corner and goes up the hill towards the Dixus. About two-thirds of the way up of the hill, I see him duck into the bushes. I grabbed a baseball bat and took after him. I said, the police will never get here in time. Somebody's got to stop this guy. It turned out <laughs> he was a student that didn't know anything about the, the, the martial law, uh, about the curfew, and he stepped into the bushes to say hello to the Burnell kids who lived at the top of the hill, and when he saw me coming with a baseball bat, he took off around the corner where he resided. Um, I really got a lot of flack over that because of the way I reacted, but in my mind, something bad was about to happen and I was going to stop it. <laughs> and what date was this Saturday night? This would have been um, probably the third. That would have been, that would have, Sunday night. It could have been the second Saturday or it could have been Sunday the, the third. third. It was probably the third. And you were feeling, so at that time, and you live only a few blocks from the campus. Right. Oh so, yeah, the helicopters, the tanks. Mm. They they were all part of it. It was just an unreal, an unreal situation. So yeah. Well, I think it's I important. did entertain the National Guard one day for lunch. Hmm. Uh huh. I invited them to come to have lunch on my. No. My, my, no, it was a filming crew. It was. Yeah, it was a filming crew from England. Oh, okay. Who came over here to film what was going all on right. on our campus? Uh, <coughs> but it was a it was a week or two later or something. Mm -hmm. They were rehashing all what had occurred. <laughs> And uh, because I got interviewed by them, we invited them to have a picnic with us. So that was who you entertained. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well. My memory's shot. <laughs> and then afterwards, <laughs> after that particular time in 1970, in, it happened to be that the, it was also a time when the town itself was going through a very dry spell. And mm -hmm. things were changing from what had the town had been downtown. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about how that town changed from what you remember in the 50s and 60s and then the 70s, which was You'll totally to different? That. Well, uh, I thought first about all the coffee clatches that occurred after May 4th. Oh, yes. Uh, how there was such animosity among different groups and a real effort to try and smooth things over and be reasonable and rational with one another. Um, because we were all traumatized by what had happened. Absolutely. Uh, that turned out to be pretty good. Um, the town 
I think, I suppose the university took a hit the first five years or so, uh, as far as attendance and enrollment and trying to make the rest of the world know it's safe here on this campus, because this is the least likely campus that something like this would have happened at. Columbia, Ohio State, uh, there were all kinds of demonstrations going on at the time. And here, here at Kent, bingo, the shootings happened. Um, I suppose that the change in the town just... We, shopping centers were opening at the time. And uh, we became very mobile and it was so easy to drive to Akron or, or to the Falls or Stowe or wherever rather than to shop downtown. So downtown was starting to struggle like a lot of downtowns still struggle. And we had many fires. The big fire? We had several, yeah. And the big one, the big one that wiped out the entire block there. That was huge. That was huge because so, that was one of the original big hotel buildings in Northeast Ohio. <laughs> At the time it was built, it was bigger than anything in Cleveland and Akron. And it was because gone? Of, yeah, it was gone. Yeah. And all the so a lot of merchants with them. Uh, Jim, you were going to tell us back in the days when you were at Thompson's Drugstore about uh, stopping selling tobacco. Interesting story. Above us was uh, Davy Tree Company, their main headquarters, and uh, lots of employees would come down to the drugstore to buy things, and particularly, we had a big tobacco department. I got kind of upset with uh, some of the deliveries we would have to make to elderly women and elderly people uh, with cigarettes when I knew they had emphysema. They had breathing problems and they're buying cigarettes. So um, it bothered me to be in a health environment trying to help people's health issues and selling cigarettes at the same time, not being a smoker. Charlie Young, of course, who was uh, still the main owner of the store at that time, was a heavy smoker. So I thought, this isn't going to be easy, but I convinced him <laughs> that the little bit of money that we made on cigarettes wasn't worth it, and we'd be better off as a health uh, provider to quit selling tobacco products. I thought, well, the people upstairs ought to get some advance notice. So I printed up a little sign, which I still have in the basement, that's going to go to the Historical Society, <laughs> and it said, in essence, that... Um, uh, as of such and such a date in July, I think it was in 1988, I think, um, we will no longer sell tobacco products. So they're forewarned by about two weeks. In the meantime, some of my regular customers were newspaper people, both from the Record Courier and from the Beacon Journal. They picked up on this, and they made a big deal out of it that I was going to quit selling tobacco. Well, I thought, I wasn't the first one to do this. There were people in, in retail that did the same thing before me, but it just hadn't happened recently. Um, as a result, the Cleveland television stations yes. would pick up on the Beacon Journal stories. So suddenly I've got people calling from the television station. It ended up... You were interviewed. They came down to... Well, who was it? What, international Radio. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it was broadcast outside the United States and over the United States, like on public uh, public radio. So I had people coming from all over sending me notes and saying Were congratulations. Were people un unhappy? I never got many complaints. One, once or twice. In fact, we had an incident where a gal came in one day. It was slippery. And she was mad as hell that we didn't have tobacco. And as she stormed out... <gasps> She hit the uh, outside uh, sidewalk, slipped and broke her leg, and sued us. <laughs> oh, oops. Yeah, she sued us because uh, she, I don't know. Well, anyway, we settled out of court. I'm but sure the insurance were, company took care of it. You were very ahead of your time in terms of what's happening right now in, yeah. 19, in 2019. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what's it, Walgreens or CVS is going to stop selling yeah, they haven't yet. tobacco. They haven't yet. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> they talk about it, but they haven't done it yet. We'll see. Is there anything else um, in your many years of living here that we have not covered that you would like to make sure posterity knows about living in Kent all these years and your life? Hmm. 
I guess I was involved enough in community service that I got a nice award over there called the Bowl of Hygieia, which is awarded once a year to one person in every state in the Union. Yeah. Really? Uh huh. We, I, can, uh, I can shoot it. Yeah. See it? It's the Bowl of Hygieia. It's that plaque. And it, who, who presented that award? Um, a. H. Robbins Company which at the time was one of the big pharmaceutical companies. They used to make a Robitussin, the best-known best product they had uh, in Richmond, Virginia. So every year they would, and they're still hosting it, but it's now a different company that's doing it because Robbins got bought out a few years ago by this acquisition and that acquisition, and I'm not sure who it is that, that gives it now, but uh, I was very happily honored. And the... Um, um, Glenn Reed Award uh, used to be called the Tree City Award. W.W. Reed. W.W. Reed, thank you. Yes. Yeah, and I was honored to receive that. So those are two awards that I've been very, been very proud of. Along and with three children we're very proud of. Yes, we have yes. good kids. Yeah, good we kids. do. Oh, yeah. They're all happy and healthy and productive. When you read about some families that have nothing but trouble with their kids, I think, oh, you know, yeah. it could be anybody. It, it could, could be, be anybody. Yeah. Yeah. No matter how good parenting oh, you yeah. try to be. Well, you have both contributed amazingly to this, to the city, and well, it's wonderful to hear your observations because I think they're, they're really spot on for people, and they'll have a very different sense well, of the what community, the town. The community is really vibrant right now. I just can't uh -huh. believe it. I said, oh, if I were still in business. <laughs> the, uh, you know, on a, on a Saturday or a Sunday, the, I would look out the front door and I'd see all the empty parking spaces, and now you go downtown and you can't find a place to park, which is a good sign. Yeah. Well, yeah. the students all went home yeah. in the 50s and 60s. <laughs> yeah. And now they, the students stay, yeah. and what's happened it's a good in place the downtown... To be. It's a good place to be, and I just... I'm happy we live in a college town. Yeah. Yeah. We've become a destination. <laughs> yes, we for have. For all the surrounding towns. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's fun. Yeah. Well, thank I you. was yes. involved in Girl Scouts at one point, and I was the neighborhood chairman. And I never had, I think I went to Campfire Girls, not Girl Scouts, but some, somehow I got pushed into this. So I had to have meetings and organize women to be Girl Scout leaders. Which was a whole new... Was this during the 60s? Probably. No, 70s. Later. No, no, 70s? 70s. Yeah. But what you haven't said is that you were also a descendant of Juliet Lowe, the founder of the Girl Scouts. Oh, yes. Oh, well, please tell <laughs> yes. us about that. <laughs> yes, in Savannah, uh, Georgia. Yeah. She had visited in England where they had had girl scouting and uh, came back to this country, and uh, she was such an organizer that she started the Girl and Scouts. This is in Savannah. Yeah, in Savannah. Yeah. And at the time that you did it, um, it was a big thing for young women. There were a oh, lot yeah. of young women oh, and yeah. a lot of chapters in Kent. Uh-huh. And, and was, as I said, I was a campfire girl, so... <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> and they... And I don't know. So that was a big part of what you oh, yeah. were doing. And you have... You had kids, obviously, in the Girl Scouts, Sure. Right? Oh, yeah. 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 Both are With girls. With their badges. Both are girls. Our <laughs> well, children are Jennifer Elizabeth Siebert, uh, Laura Beth Patton, and David Wilkett Myers. They range right now in age from 57 to 62. That's How did we get those kids so old? <laughs> they can't be our kids. <laughs> they can't be our kids. Well, anyhow. So is that the end of the interview? That is the oh, end of the right. wine. Now we can have wine, wine. or shrimp. <laughs>